Good evening. My name is Gail Mitchell and I'm chair of the Vivian G. Harsh Society. Welcome to the third event of our virtual panel discussion series, Exploring Progressive Women and Political Values. Event one dealt with the 2020 elections, successes and setbacks. Event number two covered the 2022 midterms, defying conventional wisdom. Tonight, our theme will be progressive women, different perspectives, common purpose. Our event is designed to be a safe, honest look at overcoming the obstacles to common action for progressive women. Tonight, we will hear from, hear from three women with varying viewpoints, but share common purposes. Our event will be recorded tonight and posted online for those who miss this event or want to view it later. At any time, you can submit questions in the chat for our Q&A session later on this evening. Our moderator for tonight's discussion is C.M. Winters Palacio, arbitrator, retired associate professor at City Colleges of Chicago, and former host of the professors on WYCC. We hope that you enjoy tonight's program. Take it away, C.M. Thank you so much, Gail, and welcome everyone. It is an honor to be back and it is an honor to moderate this distinguished panel. Once again, I am CM Winters Palacio and we are here to discuss part three, which is the different perspectives and perspectives and common purpose. And joining us on this panel are in alphabetical order, Kadeen Bennett, who was the Director of Advocacy and Intergovernmental Affairs at the American Civil Liberties Union, which is ACLU for the state of Illinois. We have Ms. Robin Cable, who is our Illinois State Representative for the 10th District and also the Assistant Majority Leader representing in the Democratic Party. And then rounding us off is Ms. Christina Pacioni Zayas. Did I say that correctly? Yes, okay. Yeah, okay. <laughs> and she is our Illinois State Senator for the 20th District, also in the Democratic Party. Welcome all. All right, so unmute yourselves and let's have a conversation. So audience, the way this uh, process is going to work is first, we're going to talk about personal perspectives. I'm going to each ask each one of the panelists to summarize their journey in becoming a progressive woman, et cetera, et cetera. Then we'll go into maybe another 10 minutes or 15 or so to talk about some specific hot button issues and then some other perspectives where we know that progressive women also may have some differences. We'll close out our discussion by connecting, discussing how we can partner better on commonalities, things of that nature, strategies that work, and then we'll have some Q&A. The Q&A will be co-hosted by Ms. Paula Perdue, and she is waiting in the wings. Then we'll close, okay? Sounds good. Sounds fair? All right, here we go. So when it comes to personal perspectives, I'd like each one of the panelists to summarize your journey in becoming a progressive woman. Let's talk about some of your influences. And then I want to come back around and talk about what progressive means to you. So hold on to that part, OK? So at this point, let's start with uh, Kadeen. Can you tell us about your journey of becoming a progressive woman? Uh, I think the statement, the personal is political, is super applicable because I think it's based on the lived experiences that I've had, the lived experiences of my family members and friends and the different communities that have lived. And I've, I, was, I was saying to folks earlier, I moved around a lot. So I went to four different high schools, multiple middle schools, um, and growing up in an immigrant family, growing up different levels of working class, working poor, um, being the first of so many things, the first person to go to college, I have a first person that go to graduate school. Um, and so I think that shaped uh, how I see things. Um, you know, I grew up in for a part of the time in the church and realized quickly when I started asking too many questions and I was told you don't have to come to like youth ministry time because I would ask things like why can't a woman become a minister or you know why can't we support gay people and so I think um, 
I think those kinds of lived experiences and seeing firsthand um, the lack of equity. So I remember I was going to high school in Florida and one of the schools that I went to, which was predominantly black, we were in a trailer and we would have these Xerox copies of things. That's how we would get our lesson plans. And then I went to a different school in Florida that was predominantly white and the access to extracurricular activities and uh, all of these things I didn't have access to before, it was pretty clear and they, they were probably like two miles apart. So I think some of those experiences definitely impacted me. And I think some formative things was one of my first real jobs out of uh, college was to work with this organization called the Women's Institute for Leadership Development for Human Rights, Wild for Human Rights. Mm -hmm. And it was um, run by this amazing woman, Krishanti, who um, really instilled in me the idea of people who are impacted need to be at the table where decisions are made about them. And they need to be at the table informed. So it's not just sitting at the table, but being prepped and ready to go. And I think having um, the experience of doing a lot of young women led activism and young women led work with a policy frame uh, and helping me to understand that policy has the ability to change things if done well. I think those were some of the influences that um, helped me to have the viewpoint that I have and it definitely is still in, it is instilled in me as I think about how I do my work. Oh, thank you for sharing that. When you, uh, the moment you said you grew up in church, it resonated because one of the things that I always it defines me as I always say, I grew up in church. I'm a preacher's daughter. So there were only three places I was allowed to go. And that was church, uh, what school and the library. So I totally understand, especially. And then when you were talking about, you know, sitting in church and then having those hard questions and yeah. not having wanting people wanting to give you those answers. In my experience, it has been, they have were giving me the answers, but it was over in the corner. Yeah, no. we didn't even have that. I mean, I think mm -hmm. it was for me, those weren't hard questions. And I think, and I think in some of the work that I see the the strength of religion, and for a long time, I had a not that great uh, relationship with religion, just based on the experiences that I had. Mm -hmm. um, but then I got connected to people who are people of faith who do reproductive rights and justice work. And I think the idea that there are folks of faith who do amazing progressive work, um, but it just didn't happen to be in the place that I was. Um, uh, and I just think about all of those other young people who are there who may be um, in situations where if only they had people who treated them like respected adults and um, we weren't, yeah, anyway, I can go on and on about religion, but you get my point. <laughs> no, I totally get your point. Hey, Robin, Share with me or share with everyone, like, like I'm, you're only talking to me, I'm sorry. Um, what was, how would you summarize your journey to becoming a progressive woman and what were some of your influences? Sure. Well, you know, I'm a child of the 60s. So uh, in the 60s, there was um, uh, a lot of movement for liberation. And one of the movements for liberation was for women's liberation. And uh, it was during college when, um, uh, you know, as I said, I, you know, I was kind of a hippie. I was traveling around a lot and living in different places. And I ended up going to this uh, women's uh, health center. And I just so appreciated the care that they gave me. You know, it was a time when uh, uh, women's health was, was just becoming recognized. And, uh, you know, our usual, um, ob gyne doctors were men and uh, they were fairly disrespectful to women. I mean, you know, the whole word uh, hysterectomy comes from the word hysteria because women were thought to be hysterical uh, about their health and not to be believed. And, you know, don't even ask a woman what she thinks because she doesn't know she's hysterical. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, I, you know, and so I was just treated so well at this women's health center. I decided after that, that I wanted to get involved in, in a women's health center. I asked the woman who helped me uh, what her education was. And she said, I have a bachelor's degree. So I thought, well, that's cool. Pretty soon I'm going to have a bachelor's degree. So I, uh, I ended up in Tampa, Florida um, and uh, with, a, with a boyfriend. He goes, oh, I want you to come stay with me after college. And I said, well, I want to work in a women's health center called me back and said, I found a women's health center for you. I'm like, fantastic. So I went down there and um, it was a great collective. And I worked there for uh, two weeks and then they, then they voted me in the collective and I could get paid. So it was actually a job. And it was one of the um, feminist women's health centers, 
which were health centers that were created all across the country. They came out of, um, they came out of uh, San Francisco, I think. And, um, you know, our, our Bible was kind of uh, Our Bodies Ourselves, which was done by a Boston Women's Health Collective. And it was, you know, a really liberating, exciting times when, um, you know, women, we were really taking back control of our own health care and our own bodies. And we learned to listen to ourselves, listen to our bodies and uh, really be able to create better health conditions for us. Um, and so I would say that's where I first learned um, and became more progressive in that sphere. And then from there, you know, you start working in the Women's <coughs> Liberation Union, you know, uh, uh, as, a, as a whole entity, not just the women's health aspect. And, um, uh, and from the Women's Liberation Movement, you also, be, uh, you know, uh, became more aware of some of the other struggles for civil rights. And um, so you began to work more with other organizations who were fighting for uh, uh, all different kinds of rights for all people. Impressive. Christina, tell me about, well, let me ask you this. Do you have a similar experience where there was something personal or impactful that happened or influenced you into that journey of becoming a progressive woman? Absolutely. Um, it's been super interesting listening to everybody's journey and also seeing kind of the, the overlap and the intersections of how we've all come into this work. And I think, you know, particularly Kadeen, um, that whole personal is political is so a part of my constitution. I, um, I was the only child of two community organizers who met at the Logan Square Boys and Girls Club here on the northwest side of Chicago. Um, one started off as an after-school photography instructor, the other uh, headed up the open gym. Both of them have hearts of gold and, you know, ultimately um, are about kind of using their gifts to build community. And they worked their way up and became program director and executive director. So all of my early years, were at the Boys and Girls Club. So for me, like community is family. Mm -hmm. uh, they worked around the clock to do everything from negotiating gang truces to ensuring that families had basic needs met, but also having, you know, a really clear um, objective of affirming and centering young people in their work. Um, and so kind of growing up in that setting really kind of set the tone for me about uh, what, you know, it was the family business and I guess I've kind of picked it up, right? And um, at a really critical point in the work, I was about seven years old and my mom became physically disabled. And it was really interesting because, you know, for some people that may be a really traumatic experience and, you know, she uses a wheelchair to this date. But I think for me, what was sort of the the, the memory that like has the deepest impression is how the community wrapped around us mm -hmm. um, in, in a way that, you know, raising money for us, filling in for my family in so many different ways. And it was really a sense of like, we're not in this alone, right? And, and everything that you put out into the world does come back to you multiple fold in so many ways, but really seeing how we're all intrinsically tied, our present, our past, our future, and how we're responsible for each other. Um, but also with my mom, you know, using a wheelchair, I also began to see um, kind of how, you know, systems of oppression intersect, right? I'm Puerto Rican and Italian, so I definitely have the political education around Puerto Rico being a colony of the United States and understanding what colonization does, um, not only geographically and politically and economically, but internally, but then also seeing how individuals or people with disabilities, how they are perceived um, by a society that is ableist. Um, and so it was really interesting to kind of observe all of that. And then as I went through my education, I began to see other intersectionality play out. When I was in high school, my best friend, um, she came out um, and she and I started a gay straight alliance. Our high school was not okay with that, right? And so we organized and we ended up calling a press conference to say, hey, 
you know, what's the problem here? You know, why are we not affirming young people's identity and, um, you know, who they, who they really are? And so that kind of just, you know, followed the tread line when I was in college. I went to University of Illinois, the mascot was a Native American, was definitely a part of that whole movement to get rid of the racist mas mascot. Um, but it, it's just, you know, has continued to kind of build and build and build. I'm a student of critical race theory, which is now like totally in <laughs> the headlines. Um, yet I was, you know, entrenched in that framework 20 years ago and it totally informs everything that I do today. So um, it's, it's a collection of stories, right? But it's ultimately understanding that um, this work is about collective liberation. Also to speak to what you know, uh, Robin had said with respect to liberation and liberatory work. Um, I think now we're just a little bit more explicit in, in our language and calling out um, racism and specifically anti-Black racism um, and calling out white supremacy and the intersection of white supremacy, patriarchy and capitalism and how all of these are um, problematic. And, you know, really the work that we're trying to do is unravel that and transform systems to be more human centered. So it's just been an interesting journey um, going through this, but I also see a lot of the commonality in terms of our, our collective journey. Thank you so much. And before we go to the next uh, question, I want to say that in um, Christina, I especially had a front row seat almost to your journey um, by way of my best friend, Pita Guadalupe. And so you know, I know you guys were in the master's program over there. I was in the master's program at the Graduate School of Library and Information Science. And I remember us talking about the mascot and um, the, and I think at that point, that's what I wanted to do, like these micro petty protests. So I would send a check for a penny and then come to find out they actually cashed the check. And oh I, was, my goodness. I was like, wow. <laughs> but long story short, that journey began that long, you know, began far, not long ago, but you want to say it started a while ago. Absolutely. And finally, you know, the product of that work is finally coming to fruition. So kudos to everyone for your persistence. And I want to now ask you to do the audience and I a favor. And that is to define what is, or what does progressive mean to you? But this is what we wanna do. I wanna play a game of and. I don't want anyone to repeat anyone else. Okay, so I'm going to pass it to one person and then very casually, I'm going to sound like one of my teenagers and I'm going to go and. All right, so let's play a game of and and what does progressive mean to you? Let's start with Robin. What does progressive mean to you? Oh, mute. I will, I'll start with the easy one, anti-racist. Okay, so progressive means anti-racist and, Kadeen? Basic access to things that people need to survive. And I may go a little long, like when I think about some of progressive ideas, in some ways it's not even things that are progressive. You're talking about things like equity, bodily autonomy, freedom from bias. Like those are some of the things that I think about when I think of progressivism, even though those things shouldn't be seen as progressive, it should be basic. Mm -hmm. And Christina? Purposeful disruption of the status quo and the three-headed monster of white supremacy, patriarchy, and capitalism. Now. Now, now let's sink our teeth into what we just said. So progressive means anti-racist, basic access. And those like, Christina, you got to give me something because I love where we're going with this. Look, we said anti-racist, basic access. And Christina? Purposeful disruption. And purposeful that is disruption. Well of the status quo. Oh my goodness. That's like one of the best definitions of progressive that I've ever heard. It really is. And it's, 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 it really made my heart race to hear that because it's so 
purposeful about what's going on right now. And I want to use that energy to go into the next section to talk about some of these hot button issues. And I want to, before we go in, uh, Christina, you talked about especially the intersectionality of these oppressions. And I'm so relieved, honestly, I am relieved as fit being 50 years old now that we're now almost allowed to talk about those intersectionalities because it seems as if that when back in the day when we talked about them and they began to converge, people automatically wanted you to stop and separate them. Now let's address this and let's address this. And what it ultimately ended up being, in my opinion, was a time trap. It was a stall. Let's talk about your feelings. Let's get a better understanding. But I'm so happy because it's 2021. And I'm like, we should be there already, but even enough to say, okay, what do we need to do, right? I am an educator. I am fatigued with researching problems and talking about problems. I am so solutions driven in these next, you know, 50 minus years that I'm left on this earth because I'm just impatient. So, Let's talk about some topics that make people impatient and uncomfortable, right? The first one, abortion rights. Where are we on abortion rights? I want you to, oh, let's talk about reproductive rights. Let's put a bigger, bigger umbrella over it. Reproductive rights and the right to birth control, counseling and healthcare options for women. Who would like to begin? I mean, oh, go ahead, brother. Yeah, Kadeem, go ahead. What's your perspective when it comes to reproductive rights? You're catching me at a tough time because in Springfield this past session, one of the bills that we were moving, and thank you to uh, Robin and Christina for being sponsors and, and leaders of this, is a bill to repeal the parental notice of abortion rights law. So in Illinois, we have a law that says if a minor wants to have an abortion, she has to notify an adult family member, very limited in terms of who that is, before she can have the abortion. So it's not even consent, it's notifying. And so this disregards the idea that for every other pregnancy related decision, minors don't have to talk to anyone, tell anyone that's not the case, but abortion is treated differently. And um, while we passed the Reproductive Health and Access Act a few years ago to keep Illinois safe, this was during the time of Trump. So if it were to fall, there would be protections in place in our law. For some folks, the idea of talking about young people and abortions, it's just like, even for pro-choice people, it's a different thing for them, for some pro-choice people, where it's like, I get abortions, but like minors, then that would mean that minors have sex, and then that would mean abortion without trusting the young woman. And it creates this barrier to access where either a minor has to notify a family member that they may not be able to notify or there could be some real repercussions for it or they could be forced to carry a pregnancy to term. So this idea of trusting young women to make the best decisions and trusting young people um, and we still have a law in the books and that bill didn't move this session and it's not because we don't have the votes for it. I mean we have the votes in both chambers but I think there was a concern about what constituents would say and then there was a huge backlash from the um, anti-choice folks, a lot of it religiously based. So that's a long-winded way of saying saying that um, I think people, there's still a stigma attached, you know, more and more people are saying that they've had abortions. When I worked in the Bay Area, I worked for this uh, exhale, a, a post-abortion talk line, and it was just so illuminating to me because I would be on phone calls with people who are like, well, I'm actually, I don't believe in abortions, but my abortion is different. Or people who are folks of faith who are like, I know I'm not allowed to, but I, I did this. So this is basic healthcare that over time people have made it um, this, this weapon. Um, and I feel like we should be, I guess, to your point about, you know, being done with certain things, it's, it's being done with that stigma. Because so many women um, and people have abortions and it, it shouldn't be this taboo subject anymore. I agree. It's it, and it's not a taboo subject in my house, but putting on my mom lids, I've only got I've I've got experience with a parenting only one daughter. And so you're saying that this bill will allow my daughter to proceed with a, an abortion without notifying me at what age? 
So under 18, but here's the thing, most young people talk to an adult family member. Most of the young people who have the relationships with their parents do, but not all young people do. So mm -hmm. it's, it's creating a hurdle for the most vulnerable young people. And the reality is your daughter could, um, if she were to get pregnant, carry a pregnancy to term, and she never has to tell you about that pregnancy. So again, it's stigmatizing this one particular medical decision very differently than any other. You know, Kadeen, that's tough, but I accept it. it. That's tough, but I accept it. I, it's tough. That's tough. That one just hit me, but I accept why, why is it tough though? Because it's my daughter. It's like, it's, I don't know. I don't know how to put it into words. And it's certainly not judging or stigma. Mm -hmm. I'm not, I'm not here to say that, oh, I'm not aloof about my daughter or sexual activity. I don't know. It's just, it just, it does. However, but it doesn't make me uncomfortable enough to block someone else. That's why I said, that's tough. Yeah. That's tough, but I get it because you're right. There are some who do not have anyone to talk to or cannot talk to. And sometimes it may be the very adult that is responsible for that. So I get it, I get it, I get it, I get it. I swear I get it. It's tough though, but I get it. All right, now, um, Christina, reproductive rights. Where are you at on this issue? I mean, this is like a no brainer for me. I um, have always been a huge advocate. Um, I was an HIV AIDS peer educator in high school and then carried that through college, which then opened me up to, you know, larger topics around, um, you know, sex education and comprehensive sex education. Um, and then of course the reproductive rights piece. I um, am a supporter of the repeal of the Parental Notification Act. I, I too am a parent, I, I can, empathize with the concerns. Um, but I also think, you know, to, to Kadeen's point, when you think about really um, who, what are we trying to solve for with this particular policy and who specifically are we trying to make whole? Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, in the case of your situation, you know, I'm sure you have a productive and loving and supportive relationship with your daughter. Um, but in the instances where young people don't have that, whether it be their biological parent or the guardian, or if there's abuse and neglect happening there, or very just dangerous kind of um, unsafe situations, when you add this to it, you just have to think about and having to um, push a young person to go to a judge to mm -hmm. seek permission for this again another layer and 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 you are chipping away at the humanity of this individual who is trying to ultimately take control of their life um and that's really what reproductive rights to me are about mm -hmm. is ensuring that people are whole and that they have the self-determination to figure out what is right for them their bodies and their life course um and 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 I, you know, I, I, I try to lead with my parenting around as uncomfortable as sometimes my children make me because they will check. I mean, children will check you, especially if they're young. There's like no filter. <laughs> um, last year, I, I, I wrote an op-ed about how amazing the mobilization that we were like witnessing in the uprising was led by young people. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and I was um, in the op-ed talking about like it starts very young this you know this kind of um, social justice frame with young children and I was sharing it with my daughter who's eight and I was telling her I was like look mommy has this op-ed and it's all about you know young people and leadership and all that she's like Psh, you always trying to tell me what to do and I was like oh <laughs> So, I mean, there's those moments, right, where, you know, you you want to protect, you want to support, you want to wrap around. But I also think part of the journey for parents, particularly when we're thinking about reproductive rights, is to, to let your, your child go and, and, and hope that they make the right decisions for themselves, but also to know ultimately that you are unconditionally there to support them if there's something happening. And so anyways, I digress. Point is, is that we need to go ahead and own our bodies and make our own decisions and all that. And I mean, Robin, I was just 
clutching my pearls when thinking about those male gynecologists because I had I told my gynecologist when I was pregnant I was like I don't do men except for my husband (laughs) if you're gonna be up in my body it's not going to be another man looking at me (laughs) I'm completely understood understood Robin when it comes to reproductive rights where are you on this issue so um you know I was around before uh Roe v Wade So there's a lot of history there. Mm -hmm. And um, when we finally got Roe v. Wade and abortion was legal, we still, very soon after that, we had the Hyde Amendment, which said that any, no federal dollars could be used for abortion. So what happened after that is that most states then could not use their Medicaid program to provide abortions. And, um, and it, it, we really developed a two tier system. So women who had private insurance or had money could get a legal abortion. Women who had Medicaid could not, mm-hmm. uh, you know, it was only in the light in the, if the women's life was in danger, right? right. I mean, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> and, um, and, but yet understand this because this goes into the whole issue of, of racism, uh, yet in the Medicaid program, you could, ha- you could be sterilized. So you could still use federal dollars to be sterilized, but you could not use federal dollars to have an abortion. So it really created this two-tier system that has gone on up until today. I know that the Biden administration is talking about getting rid of the Hyde Amendment finally, and I hope they do. I mean, it was a miracle a few years ago in this state, we finally got rid of the Hyde Amendment in Illinois, um, but it went on for since the late seventies. So what is that, 40, 50 years? Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I, I think Illinois really is, is a beacon. I know that you're upset, Kadeen, with what happened this year, but I mean, in general, it really is a beacon for women's reproductive rights. You know, we all, we, you know, we, be, I believe that you know, the most important thing you can have control over is your body. And without having control over your body, you really have nothing. So, um, so the fact that we do have legal abortion here, that we have a number of abortion clinics throughout the state, that um, uh, uh, we now passed a bill finally to get birth control over the counter. So you can go in and, and your pharmacist can now give you birth control pills. So you don't have to go schedule an appointment with the gynae and get in and pay a bunch of money. So, um, I mean, there are, there are much more dangerous uh, pills that you can now get on the shelf than birth control pills, I will tell you that. Um, so I think that, you know, and our new sex ed bill that we passed this year uh, is going to, be, going to be amazing and really help so many children grow up learning what's real and what's not real, um, you know, rather than having being taught pretend fantasy stuff in, in terms of sex ed. So I think that, um, that we are in a much better place than we were I know, many years ago. Mm-hmm. Um, do we still have farther to go? Yes, yes. But you know, I think that uh, we, really, we really have come a long way. Okay, well, thank you for I, sharing. Go ahead. I just add one thing there, and I think it's like the rights versus access. And I think in Illinois, we have a lot of rights in place. And even so, there's still the issue of access. So, you know, we know that there are some communities that they're losing um, access to hospitals or their mergers that are happening that result in having full access to reproductive health care to very limited access. And you have uh, scenarios where there may be an abortion provider in your city but can you still afford to, even with Medicaid funding, there's still issues around um, accessing this care. And then not just accessing care, accessing care that's reflective of your identity. For trans folks, it's really hard sometimes to find access to healthcare and reproductive healthcare that's reflective of their identity where they're being treated with respect. I know for poor women, women of color, women who are on Medicaid, sometimes depending on the provider, it's this, oh, so you're not a real patient. Like you're, it's like, it's fake 
make money, you know, that, that mentality. So I think that that push for access, even after we've cemented all of the rights is really important. And for folks who are listening, I really encourage you to let your legislators know that full access in Illinois is really critical. And that means repealing PNA because we are the space for people, all of the states around us, folks come here for care because some, in some situations that care is not available in their local state. Yeah. And, and on that note, let me just give a plug for the Chicago Women's Health Center that uh, does provide health care for everyone. And are they located throughout the city? There's only one. There's okay. only one. And it's on the north side, I think on Southport now. Okay. So that, that, was, that was a clinic that I started, that I worked in when I first came back to Chicago. Mm -hmm. we, we grew it from open one night a week to open six days a week. Amazing. And it's still operating and you, and it's still on donation. You know, you can pay what you can. They have a suggested fee. You pay what you can. And they're very much into uh, making sure that everyone trans, lesbian, everyone gets, gets the care and respect that they deserve. Well, I'm sure I, among others in the community, are grateful that they definitely are still around. Um, when it comes to reproductive rights, is there anything that you all disagree on? A lot of times when we get these panels, everyone, uh, there's an agreeance. Is there anything you disagree on? No? I don't think so. I don't think so? You don't think so? <laughs> That's fine. Come back to it if we do. It's okay to disagree. All right. So the reproductive rights, the right to birth, co birth control, I enjoy what you said about saying that needs to be the equal balance of their, the rights as well as access. And like I said, you got me. I, I totally understand about that common denominator. And but I, and echoing like so exactly who are we trying to make whole? And I think that's a very good reminder, Christine. I appreciate that. Um, so Kadeen, I know you were working on that bill, and hopefully you will continue working on that. Are there any other projects that the two of you are working on when it relates to reproductive rights at the moment? Yeah. Um, so. This year, I worked on the, um, the uh, midwife bill, which is a bill for uh, uh, professional midwives who are not nurses, who actually deliver babies at home. Mm -hmm. there's, there's, uh, over the years, um, there were doctors who used to have uh, home, home birth practices, and they've pretty much dried up. And a lot of the uh, uh, nurse practitioner midwives um, also, it's very difficult for them to practice on their own and, and to find doctors to practice with them to do home births. So it really became a, uh, a movement of, um, of uh, lay midwives, or as we call now, professional certif certified midwives, women who many of them were trained in Wisconsin or trained in other places. Um, uh, it, is, it is a, a title that is recognized and a, in many other states, I don't remember how many now, but I, I think over 30, and, but in Illinois, it was still illegal. So it was, it was kind of an underground uh, movement mm -hmm. um, that, uh, that um, tried to practice. Um, it, was, it was difficult because if anything should happen, and you know, even if you take uh, if you if you have a policy that says you know only women who are not high risk who you know you screen people really well things can still happen, and when they would transfer them to the hospital, the hospitals would want to know who did this, who was the midwife, why did you do this, you know we're going to report you to DCFS because you endangered your child, um, and and uh, be so angry with them sometimes even delay medical care because they were so busy yelling at them. And the women uh, were not going to say who the midwife was because the midwife then would be charged with practicing medicine without a license and could go to jail. Mm -hmm. So uh, it, it was kind of ridiculous um, that, that this was going on here in this state. And we tried for many years to get the certified midwives uh, who did home births to, be cert to get a certification here. Um, and uh, uh, finally, a couple years ago, we did a um, task force, which I'm usually reluctant to do because I just feel like it's a way to stall out your, your issue. But um, in that case, I have to admit, it brought everybody to the table and made them meet for a year. And I think it just wore them down 
So this year, the medical society came to me for the first time and said, we're ready to make a deal. So I was like, hallelujah. And, uh, you know, their own, their own um, OB guineas that were ready to make a deal a couple of years ago, Mm -hmm. but the state medical study still was not. So this year they said, we're ready to make a deal. So we spent all last summer meeting about it with the nurses and the midwives and the doctors. And uh, we finally came up with a bill and we passed it and we had almost 60 sponsors. We passed the bill with, I think, very few no votes, if any. And, um, and it moved over to the, uh, I think we had one no vote. You know, and things change, conditions change. The first time I tried to do this bill was 2011, 2012. I knew I didn't have the votes. The midwife said, we want a roll call. We want to know, put it up on the board. I think we had 42 votes. Okay? You need 60 to pass a bill. And this time when we put it up on the board, 110, you know, so it was quite a difference. But, you know, as I said, conditions have changed. Republicans are suddenly much more open to this idea. You know, it's kind of like, I I, I don't quite know exactly why, but they tend to like home births. So like, okay. And um, without much opposition, it went over to the Senate. Uh, There's still uh, one issue around, uh, we're working with the law- with the trial lawyers on, so we still have one piece to finish, but it should be, it'll be finished this summer and we'll be able to vote on this in veto session in the Senate, and this will then be the law. So this whole group of women who are practicing as midwives will now be legal. They will have a relationship with a hospital so that if they need to send the patient to the hospital, they can do that freely with the woman's chart going with her with the midwife going with her. So we get all the information and, um, and it's the best thing for women's health um, that we can imagine. It's only about a thousand births a year, but still it's, it's good to make sure that that's legal and that those women can be taken care of. You know, I think that's impactful. And we talk about the intersectionality of that. I think it could lead almost I'm gonna make it lead into our next hot button issue, which is pay equity, because I'm certain I immediately when you start talking about the interruption of women or men being able to practice um, midwifery in um, here in Illinois, it is an impact on on their ability to practice in order their ability to have a fulfilling life. They have to go elsewhere in practice or they have to practice undercover in Illinois. And that's very risky. So um, kudos to you for making that happen. My niece in disclosure is, uh, is a midwife. So I'm sure she'll be happy to hear the news. She's in Wisconsin. So I know what you're talking about when you're saying you got to go to Wisconsin, et cetera. Um, so let's talk about pay equity really quick. I'm so sorry. I know we, I don't want to speed past this, but I want to get to these other two hot, the other two hot button issues that we have, and that is the pay equity, and then talk about police and practices in our communities. So let's talk about pay equity. And we're talking about pay equity, comparing women's pay to the pay of white men. Where are you at on that issue or what are you working on? Uh, Christina, let's start with you first. Um, Yeah, no, this is a huge issue because it's so frustrating when you see this actually play out. Um, So one thing we did this session, um, we adopted a resolution um, and, you know, just resolutions are just that, right? They, Mm -hmm. but they can also communicate some legislative intent. Um, But it was basically to raise awareness um, on the disparity with pay based on gender. So it declares March 24th, 2021 as Equal Pay Day, um, August 3rd, 2021 as Black Women's Equal Pay Day, September 8th, 2021 as Native American Women's Equal Pay Day, and October 21st, 2021 as Latina Equal Pay Day. And so that's an indication of how much longer we have to, um, you know, we, we have to work in order to, to, to be paid at the same rate as a white male. Um, And so, you know, obviously we know there's grand implications in this and it's not even, I I, I think not only the pay piece, but I think another area that that sort of connects to this is thinking about the pandemic and how many women 
were pushed out of the labor market because the assumption is that we are the caregivers. Mm -hmm. And whether it is we're caring for our own children, we're caring for elders, we're caring for family members or dependents who are disabled, the assumption is that it's our work. And so there was a mass exodus of women um, during the pandemic. And that's another way that our earning potential gets interrupted or disrupted um, because obviously we do not value um, the pay, I mean, value the contribution. I think another area, and this is, um, it's, it's somewhat kind of tangible, but it also is indicative of the intersectionality piece. One of the bills um, that we passed was around opening up access to pathways in higher education for early childhood professionals. This is an industry that is woefully exploited and particularly exploitative of women of color um, because the majority of early childhood professionals are women of color and they are making between 10 to $13 an hour, um, 10 hours a day, um, don't have benefits. Almost half of them are eligible for public assistance and so what we wanted to do was remove barriers by creating a consortium across the state with all of the public four-year and two-year institutions to be able to design bridge programs for upskilling our incumbent workforce. So the presumption is that if you get more education, you're going to obviously get paid more. However, still in this industry, we still struggle with that because you may only get like a two to three dollar an hour raise. Um, because again, we assume that early childhood, that sector is women's work and we do not compensate in terms of um, a, a, a level that's commensurate with the contribution to society. And so I've always framed that work as this is really the, the racial equity, the gender equity, and the economic equity issue um, because early childhood is fundamental to everything. And the childcare sector enabled our economy to function even at its diminished rate during the pandemic. But again, that's all fueled by women and women of color. Um, and so those are the types of issues um, that I try to kind of, when we think about equal pay and when we think about earning potential, um, you know, really trying to kind of get concrete in certain sectors to be able to, um, facilitate and foster greater equity with respect to earning potential and economic stability. Christina, but if I can just poke the bear just a little bit, maybe. So I work in organized labor and I was happy for that effort. But what frustrated me about that effort was the same institutions that we sought to have these collaborations about what to do in education where we're training the workforce, some of them also were the same that were underpaying the current staff of child development in their colleges and universities. So that's the and, that's another and opportunity that I really hope that when we move forward and we start pressing upon um, higher education or certain institutions to make these efforts uh, about what to do for the future, it has to be an and. Do you have anyone in your camp or in your wheelhouse right now that is also experiencing that? Because it does, it almost feels disingenuous and it's, and it's frustrating. It, it is, it's frustrating. Um, so, just a gentle. I'm with you. I'm totally, I'm totally with you. I mean, this is where that three headed monster comes out all mm -hmm. the time. I mean, institutions of higher ed, I mean, they're bastions of white supremacy, patriarchy, and capitalism. Um, when I was initially, the bill was to um, allow community colleges to seek approval to grant bachelor's degrees. Woo! The four oh, year man. institution. Man, did they turn over the tables and chairs Woo! on that one? They said, where, who, what? I mean, I can't tell you how much opposition I had. And it was great 
because I could tell I was making folks uncomfortable, right? That's that purposeful disruption. And it, it, it allowed us to move the conversation in a way that they were not going to get away with, oh, we're gonna just run a little program here and we're gonna just do this in this corner of the state and we'll solve it. And I insisted because I do think that this, to your point, it's across the board. Because even within four-year institutions, institutions of higher ed, you've got that all those disparities in terms of pay, whether it is based on gender, whether it is based on your race or ethnic identity, even the different departments, right? We value business and engineers over education. Libraries. <laughs> I'm a retired librarian. I just had a trigger. I'm sorry. I'm like, why <laughs> So I, I appreciate you raising that. And um, I'm definitely one of those legislators, like I, I get in the weeds. Um, so I'm already on implementation because it's not enough to pass a bill. Um, and and I, do, I do care about the success of this opening up access as it relates to women and their earning potential. Um, and I, I'm actually starting to incubate some ideas around um, increased compensation for our early childhood professionals because we, we need to definitely get that together. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. And I, I appreciate you receiving that. And we, I will be more than happy to join you in those weeds. <laughs> Kadeem, ACLU, pay equity, does that fall under your wheelhouse? It's something that we're definitely supportive of. There's no active bills that we're working on in that area, but it's a, a, a place that we're definitely supportive of, not just pay equity, but also paid leave and access to paid time off. Mm -hmm. And we're part of a broader coalition that works on those issues. Um, and just wanted to flag, like even our thinking about what a minimum wage is. We weren't involved in that fight, but I think it's one of those things where you hear a fight for 15 and the reality is fight for 15, $10 right now, by the time you get to 15, then the minimum wage needs to be like 25 or 30. And just so this idea of like, what would what would be a living wage? And like to imagine a world where that's the standard, because mm -hmm. you think about so many people who have to work multiple jobs to barely make ends meet. And God forbid you have a kid because then daycare and childcare is really expensive. I mean, we, we create these, we do not, give the resources that's necessary for people to live lives without stress. And I think it disproportionately impacts um, parents and it disproportionately impacts women, women of color. Um, and you just see this cycle that just never ends. So um, yeah, I just wanted to add that to the conversation. Well, there's so much more I could say about that fight for 15, but we do need to move on with time. I'm so sorry. Let's also now end with talking about policing practices in our communities, more so about ways of rethinking or redoing, like what could work. So as progressive women, do you have any ideas? And let's begin with Robin on this one. Well, this is not exactly my wheelhouse, but um, uh, first, let me congratulate you, Christina. I know that you're getting an award, I think, from Infant Welfare Society, is it, or one of the, the uh, a child care organization. So congratulations. Um, and, uh, and, and I just wanna briefly say that we did pass a bill that requires, that doesn't allow employers to ask how much you made at your last job. Because what we, what we believe what happens is you start out, women and minorities start out at a lower wage. And then every job you go to, they ask you what you made before and then give you a salary based on that. Mm -hmm. And our view is, listen, you know, you got a budget, you know how much you wanna pay this person, just pay them and don't ask how much they made before. So pay them what you think they deserve. So I was thrilled that we were able to pass that bill a couple of years ago. Um, around police, I mean, you know, when I, when I think about the police in our community, what I really think is that uh, there are so many circumstances when we don't need an armed uh, officer of the law to, to, to be at that, that circumstance. So I think there's so many times when, when we need we could we could narrow what police do and what police don't do. So for example, traffic. I don't think we need a police officer to direct traffic. I don't think we need a police officer to um, to uh, uh, patrol the highways and pull pull people over who are driving too fast. I mean, there are certain areas where we do not need 
police to be there. So I really think we need to think about other ways to um, organize our society um, and, and uh, around, around the police. Um, then in terms of this whole police and violence and the way they treat um, anybody that doesn't look exactly like them and even, even just the whole mentality of the police. Because what happens is that kind of mentality even if, if you're, you're black yourself or Latino yourself, if, you're, if you go into the police, you end up developing that same mentality that, that white police officers have. So I think it's a whole mentality that the police have um, that, that is so dangerous to our, to our, our neighborhoods. Um, so I think that you know, we, we've passed bills to, to be able to, for, the, for cameras to be on all the time and for every single, uh, local police department to have cameras and to have to wear them. It's like, okay, just know that we're watching you. You know, you know, when people go, I'm watching you, you know, that thing, whatever it is, it's like, you know, police have to know we're watching them and, you know, don't do anything that you can't defend. So I think those, those body cameras are really important. Um, I think that we've put in for a lot of education in the recent bills that we've passed um, to help uh, train and educate uh, police officers, like I kind of like re re-educating them on how to how to uh, be a police officer, but you know it's very deep, and I think it's going to take a long time, and uh, and uh, you know I think it, it's 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 an inc they're an inc yeah it's incredibly uh, uh, dangerous in so many of our of our neighborhoods, and it, it's not all, I mean the police you know I lived in Logan Square many years ago when it was a lower income neighborhood. And I mean, I saw how they treated low income white people. Do you know what I mean? It was just as, it was bad. It was bad also. So, you know, I think we have a long way to go before we were comfortable with um, how police are trained and how they interact with our society. Okay. Kadeen, we got a long way to go. What can we do right now? What could work? So one, I think there needs to be culture shift in terms of who, uh, who was in law enforcement. So we've now have a warrior mentality where people are dressed in body armor and there is a disconnect from seeing people as people and citizens. And I think maybe training is a part of it. And I think over time, I have less hope for training because we've all sat in trainings where you just wait till you could click the button to go to the next slide. And I think for some folks in law enforcement, if that's not what they think they want to do, then trainings aren't by themselves helpful. I think it has to do with more accountability. And I, you know, in Springfield in the lame duck session, um, there was uh, the Black Caucus passed their, their, one of their pillars was a justice pillar that is now named the Safety Act. And you would have thought that the sky fell in terms of how much backlash folks got for voting on things that are just so basic. They're so basic where it says, you can't kill people when they're running away from you, or you can't use force if you're not in danger of serious bodily harm or death. Like these are such basic things and you could have sworn we defunded the police and we like put them in a colony somewhere. It was just that reaction. So some of the things that can still be done that would increase accountability. One is an issue that we're working on getting rid of uh, uh, qualified immunity for law enforcement. And qualified immunity, it's this term where there's so much misinformation, but it basically says that when an officer violates somebody's constitutional rights, there shouldn't be this blanket immunity of protection. They should, this. so if you are a police officer, you violated my constitutional rights, and that's pretty harsh in terms of what it is. It's not like you, me going into a cop car and my head gets banged against the, 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 the roof. It is hard, like extreme uses of force, extreme use of force. So what happens right now is that um, you violate my rights. We, I try to take you to court. A lot of lawyers won't even take my case because of qualified immunity. So what our bill would say is you get rid of qualified immunity, then after you violate my right, we get to go to court. And instead of the judge determining whether or not qualified immunity applies, they actually focus on whether or not my rights were violated. And then there's a judgment if my rights were violated. And that's where the real accountability begins. There's not this, this blanket protection. And we did some focus groups and even people who are 100% supportive of law enforcement, uh, moderate Democrats, Republicans, when you talk to them about this blanket protection, it's like, well, no, I don't think a blanket protection should be in place, but it's something that um, police officers are, that's the hill that they will die on. So that was um, a component from that um, 
justice pillar that was removed. Um, and I think that's one way. I think standardizing our use of force policy, we're partly there in Illinois, but there's more that we can do in terms of limiting when force is used. And then real accountability when law enforcement officers abuse their power. And that may mean like losing your job because we have numerous examples of law enforcement that have committed horrible acts. People in the community know that that's the case and folks feel like nothing happens to them. Mm -hmm. I think how, you know, there's, when we're in Springfield and in our crim committee, you hear law enforcement then they tell us, you know, you all want us to do all of these things. You want us to be a therapist and a police officer, a teacher, all these things. And we agree, you shouldn't be all of those things. So I think taking stuff off their plate and thinking about other ways of imagining public safety. And it, to Robin's point, it doesn't always mean having a law enforcement officer show up. If I'm in some kind of uh, mental health crisis, I should have a counselor coming to my door. If I am autistic, there should be somebody who understands the needs of people living with autism. So there are those kinds of um, who taking stuff away from law enforcement, replacing it with more um, community-based um, folks, and then having the resources to make sure that there are those folks who are able to be hired um, and trained that non-law enforcement approach. Um, and I think it is possible to be, you know, I, I, one thing I've noticed in Springfield, even for from some folks who are progressive, is just this idea that you can't go against police officers, like they're very seen as very sacred. And it was especially interesting after um, January 6th to be in a lot of negotiation around policing issues. And just to see that like we had a whole summer where people were just like fired up and they wanted to do something that was real meaningful change. And the things that community people and advocates were saying, these are the policy changes you can make. There was still a resistance to do it. So I guess when I think about folks who are listening who are progressive, you, in some ways you can be a progressive if you're really hesitant about policing issues. And there's a difference between defunding police and appropriately funding police and taking jobs away from them. And some of the, the legislative pushes aren't extreme at all. It's just like this basic level of there needs to be accountability. You can't go rogue and have no repercussions at all. And I shouldn't worry if I'm picking up my phone to call 911, whether or not I'm going to survive, whether or not my neighbor is going to survive. These are just really basic things. And I think um, there just needs to be a huge, huge shift. I hear you loud and clear. Christina, where do you want to end on this topic? Um, I, I definitely, you know, agree with uh, both of our other esteemed panelists. I um, I'm really proud that, you know, we, the General Assembly passed the Community Emergency Services and Supports Act, um, and that is specifically to, to set up the infrastructure and the goals that Kadeen was just speaking to, so that we have mental health professionals addressing issues um, that are more endemic to that versus police officers. Um, I think that, you know, the other piece, again, too, to talk about appropriately funding the police, I, I, I'm, I'm more for, I, I don't believe that police officers sign up to be social workers, um, first responders when it comes to like mental health issues. Um, conflict mediators with domestic violence issues, um, you know, I, I, they're not trained to do that. I don't think they go into this work to do that. And we need to fund the areas where root cause in terms of the issues that produce, the root causes that produce violence, community violence. We need to ensure that we have affordable housing, that individuals are able to make a livable wage, that people are safe and whole. Public safety is really what we're seeking. Law enforcement is a whole nother framing. And so thinking about that reframing, you know, from the warriors to a more guardianship, in terms of, you know, supportive, um, because if we are attending to people's basic needs in terms of ensuring that they have housing, ensuring that their health needs are met, ensuring that, that we have um, productive and healthy relationships, um, you're not going to see the violence that we see today. And it certainly is not going to get um, remedied with punitive measures. And so, um, I, and I think about the way that you can really tell where our priorities are 
is how much we spend towards law enforcement versus the very core functions of our society. And you see it very lopsided towards law enforcement, yet we're not getting the outcomes it's supposed to produce. You know, some analysis that had been done because my background is more education, but we were specifically, I was involved in a campaign around removing the school resource officers from Chicago public schools um, because, I mean, there's a multitude of reasons, but I think the most logical one is when you invest four times the amount in school resource officers than what you do for social workers and um, college advisors in our schools, why are we surprised that the outcomes are what they are with respect to the number of arrests of young people, the involvement with law enforcement, and the graduation rate not being where it should be? And so it just doesn't make sense to me when we put those dollars in one bucket and then lament why we don't have outcomes in the other bucket. And so um, it's, it's just super logical to me to think about invest, uh, redirecting investments to the, the core areas versus law enforcement um, because they didn't sign up to do this particular work and they spend very small amounts of time um, compared to interfacing with mental health issues and, and with the domestic violence issues um, than they do with what they supposedly had signed up for. Okay. All right. I, we covered a lot. <laughs> we covered a lot. We covered a lot. I know we're, we're going a little bit over time. So uh, Paula or Gretchen or Gail, feel free to give me a, a elbow pull, but I want to keep pushing because I want us to get to this last section because it kind of ties everything together. A lot of times when we have these panel conversations, um, we all come together and we talk about the problem. And, you know, I always say, you know, we describe the water while drowning. We know it's wet, we know it's cold, we know it's deep, right? Um, and the last thing we want to do is we want to, we don't want to be on the shore saying, man, that water sure does look cold, <laughs> you know? So when we start talking about these issues and the different perspectives that we have as progressive women, how do you move through those ideas and connect and partner? How do you collaborate? How do you come to a consensus? What does that look like? What strategies work? I'm gonna lean on Kadeen first because I know, uh, I'm gonna automatically assume with all the work that you do at the state capitol, what strategies work? Yeah, so I tell people that working for the ACLU, we have no permanent friends or enemies. At some point, we're gonna piss you off based on the position that we take. And <laughs> wait, <it's> <laughs> wait, say that again. <laughs> oh, we have no permanent friends or enemies. Um, so, you know, we work on a multitude of issues. So for example, there is no Republican in the, you know, for the last three or four years who voted on any of our reproductive rights issues, but they're good with privacy issues. So, mm -hmm. you know, and there are times where our best friends on some issues may be really upset about our free speech views. So, um, and I think it's important and I, it's a value from just living life is meeting people where they are. So how do you get to have a conversation where I may not shift your position on an issue today, but I could in three years from now or the next bill I'm working on. So, and I've seen that with some legislators around trans issues, for example, where when we first had that conversation, it was like, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't understand pronouns. Why are you talking to me about this? Mm -hmm. Over time, they're able to get, well, if you care about folks of color, think about, you know, for trans folks, they're at the bottom of the barrel in terms of power. And that's the thing that gets them. So I think meeting people where they are is really important. I think being honest about where you are and what you're willing to do. So for example, at the ACLU, we're incrementalist on some issues. And I think as we engage in partnerships, being very honest about that, so folks aren't surprised and having a sense of what your bottom line is and if that could be a place of alignment. Um, and then trying to do no harm. So if we are working on an issue and somebody else's and their position may be a defund and ours may not be fully defund, how can we be in this space together and not harm each other as we approach the work? So those are some of the things that, that come to mind. Excellent, excellent. Christina, what strategies work for you? 
Um, I believe very deeply in coalition building um, because I think when you know you can involve multiple stakeholder groups in the solution designing process, I think you end up coming up with um, some really you know kind of well vetted uh, solutions. You're not you know kind of working in silos or in a vacuum. Um, I also, I believe really deeply in having a strong um, partnership um, with individuals who will be benefiting from the policies that we are passing. Um, it, it's, it's just, uh, it always kind of boggles my mind when we speak on behalf of people and we don't authentically and genuinely invite them to the table and make space for them and center their voice in a way where they're leading the work. Um, we're just the quarterback of the strategy. I mean, that's how I always look at it, mm -hmm. um, which for me is um, a, an accountability mechanism. You know, I think what's really important and what I've found at least in this short period of time, I took some of my organizing strategies um, and, and that was to have a constant feedback loop with constituents and stakeholders. I, I would hold, you know, monthly virtual town halls to get information back to make sure that I'm being accountable to the folks I'm representing, but then also to invite them in the process of bill analysis and to also take some of their ideas and say, hey, let's, you know, let's draft this up, let's push it and let's, you know, develop the tactical strategy to get it through. So, I mean, as you can see, one of the, the ways that I operate is in collaboration. Um, it's a partnership, it's a, it's a give and take. Um, and to, you know, Kadeen's point, sometimes there'll be some strange bedfellows. I mean, I, I was really surprised with my community college bill of the Republicans that supported it, yet some folks in my own caucus were adamantly against it. Mm -hmm. um, and so you, you try to figure out where you have some common ground, because ultimately, again, if you're trying to solve for a problem that is systemic, that is about making folks whole, you try to figure out the tactical strategies to get it over the, the goal line. I agree. I agree. Robin, I know I'm getting, I'm, now I'm, someone is pulling my elbow now and we want to go into Q&A because our audience is anxious to ask us some questions. So I'm going to go to Q&A and I'm hopeful that one of those questions will be about this and I will definitely pass that over to you. Is that a fair? That's fine. I, I don't think I have much to add. I think they did a good job. Thank you so much. Okay, now everyone, I'd like to introduce to you uh, my partner in crime, Ms. Paula Perdue, and she will help facilitate our Q&A. Paula, what questions do we have for our panelists? Oh, you may be muted, Paula. Oh yeah, Paula, you're muted. Okay, is that better? Yes. So mm -hmm. one of the questions is, how do we make sure that incoming police cadets are not white supremacist or hold white supremacist views? That is a cut to the chase question. Who <laughs> wants to answer that one? Are there are personality tests that it, for many jobs you have to take. So they have to make sure that you're not a pedophile, that you're not a criminal that you know you don't have a lot of bad there are these kind of personality tests that you can give people so I are think you saying that we need to add anti-racism to the personality test i do i do yeah that's very specific i like that any other any other suggestions from the panel uh, well, I, um, th there are those bias tests, and I think that those are those can be illuminating. But I think also um, I want to say that Kadeen had made this point earlier about the system of law enforcement. Um, I would argue is inherently white supremacist. It incentivizes. I mean, you think about the roots of you know where policing came from, right? In terms of slavery, and so um, you know it's. If, if we situate it in the individual, the, the folks that are coming in, then on some level, we're not paying as much attention to how the system incentivizes um, white supremacy and the application of that. Mm -hmm. um, so, so it really is a paradigm shift and rethinking what we 
um, reward in terms of behavior that lead to outcomes that really should be about, again, making folks whole. Yeah, I, I think it's really important to acknowledge the history of the role of policing and enslavement in, in America. Um, you're definitely correct about that. Kadeen, how do you want to answer this question? What do you want to add to it? What's your and? I think uh, Christina captured it. I think, you know, it's looking at the system and it's increasing accountability. Because I think there are some people who may go into being a police officer with the best of intentions and that best of intentions gets beaten down because that's not the way you're supposed to do the work. So rewarding people based on their com connection to community or the people who don't have any kind of use of force, excessive use of force um, situations, like those kinds of positive benefits too, I think can be really important because then you see, well, if I want to succeed, then I actually have to start treating people with respect and I have to rethink the way that I approach public safety. Mm -hmm. And thank you for reminding about the usage of the word public safety right away. I'm gonna definitely adopt that as well. Paula, our next question. I think you're muted again, Paula. One of the questions is how do you all feel about repealing the PNA bill? Great. Let's do it. ASAP. It's been done already a long time ago. I was waiting to press the green button. And for those who are not familiar, what is the PNA bill? So it's the bill we chatted about earlier that would repeal the Parental Notice of Abortion Act. And it would allow minors to make decisions about their reproductive health care just in the same way that they're able to make any other pregnancy decisions. So please call your legislator if there's one thing you can do today to let them know that you support repeal of PNA. And if your legislator is Christina or Robin, please tell them thank you because that matters as well. Yeah. Oh, thank you for adding the thank you. I appreciate that. And you know, I also, and also we want to keep an eye on the midwife bill as well, too. So I'm, I'm glad, happy to hear us talking about the work we're doing um, and being specific about those bills, because I think that's a way of raising awareness and civic engagement. Uh, and I'm a huge, huge fan of news literacy and people being informed and engaged, but also speaking precisely about the remedies to this, you know, or their solutions. So thank you so much. Paula, do we have time for more questions? Don't forget to unmute. Paula. Paula, you're muted again. Okay. <laughs> oh, that's it. There are no more questions. I thought I saw one about what are our plans for 2122. Yes. Yeah, so let's talk, let's end out our conversation talking about what are your plans for 2021 and 2022 in this upcoming year. Now, I will say that I, at the beginning of the hour, I do believe um, there are many who share my impatience, my lack of patience, because it's 2021 and we've been discussing these things and we've been experiencing these things. My daddy's been experiencing them. My mama's been experiencing them. And I'm like, all right, it's 2021. It's time for some solutions. So what are you working on in 2021 in addition to the PNA bill, Kadeem? So uh, we're also working to get rid of qualified immunity. The other bill that didn't make its way through um, the Senate is a bill to remove uh, barriers to individuals who are seeking a name change who have a felony background. So right now in Illinois, if you have a felony background or if you're on any kind of registry, there is a 10 year or in some cases permanent bar to being able to change your name. This is especially harmful to folks who are trans, to folks who are survivors of trafficking. Um, it also impacts people who have changed their names for religious reason. So we want to make sure we get rid of that. And the harm is pretty great. One of the folks who is part of our coalition talked about recently, I think it was sometime in May, they went to the doctor's office um, and their um, a legal name was called and it does not reflect their uh, gender identity and who they are. And that causes a lot of um, safety issues for folks. And mm -hmm. it always outs them day after day. Um, the other issue that we're working on is a bill that would defelonize low-level drug possession. So we know the war on drugs 
drugs was problematic. There's too many people in our communities who are in prisons and who have been in jail. And so this bill would basically say that if it's you know low level uh, under three grams for in some instances that that would go from a felony to a misdemeanor because we know that having a felony record can have huge impacts on, on, on folks. So that's uh, those are some of the things we're working on. Thank you so much for your work. Christina, what are you working on in 2021? Um, I had already mentioned the um, compensation issue, compensation parity for our early childhood professionals. Um, but I also want to see, uh, we, were, we were trying to get this in the budget, the expansion of the earned income tax credit. Um, I was a part of a task force that like really studied universal basic income and expanding the categories of individuals who could um, take advantage of earned income tax credit, whether you're a caregiver, whether you're a college, you know, post-college student, um, taking care of um, elders. Uh, the, I just think the, the more opportunities we provide um, families with, you know, limited economic resources, um, pathways to achieve economic stability, I think we're going to be far better off. Um, I also, you know, this is something, you know, it kind of speaks a little bit to what uh, Kadeem was talking about, the use of pronouns, um, particularly for the LGBTQ community. And I have a pet peeve around language like that word minority really like drives me up a wall because we are not a minority in so many ways so many different geographies um, and and I feel like it's dehumanizing and so I have a whole um, kind of diatribe on decolonizing language and I want to really explore that and the Black Caucus you know took some leadership with respect to the pillars to talk about you know certain labels and language and I'd like to continue to support and advance that because language I do believe matters and it helps to kind of frame um, what we're working on and so those are kind of the three core areas along I mean there's a host of education issues in early childhood I want some universal child care in my life <laughs> I want free college all of that you know all the good stuff but we've got we, we've got to work our way there okay and robin your agenda thank you so I, your uh, to-do list uh the two big issues that i'll mention are um one is to have a state health plan which would be to allow uh, make sure that everyone has access to health coverage here in the state so there's a few ideas i'm going to be working with a group to uh figure out which would be the best one for Illinois, we still have, you know, 10 to 20% of our, our uh, folks are, are uninsured and therefore lack access to health care in a deeper way than a lot of the rest of the people do. And then uh, hopefully maybe this summer we'll end up getting our, our clean energy bill. So still working on saving the planet in terms of uh, getting rid of carbon and increasing our use of uh, a renewable energy and making sure that the vast majority of our energy is clean by uh, by 2045. Sounds like a plan. Sounds like you guys are going to be busy and it sounds like there are more than enough opportunities for all of us, including those who are watching, to engage and to collaborate and to assist. It's been a pleasure moderating this panel. Audience, I certainly hope that you have walked away informed and engaged and feeling a little bit more empowered about being a progressive woman, especially. And thank you, and Gail, go back to you. All right, thank you so much, Sam. And thank you, ladies, for all of your insight and um, uh, issues that we've discussed. Uh, I'd like to apologize for any uh, technical glitches we may have had at the beginning of our program. So thank you for hanging in there and uh, uh, making sure that uh, you enjoyed the program. Uh, this is uh, the third of our series, Exploring Progressive Women and Political Values. And this was sponsored by the Next Steps Collaborative, the Amer which consists of the American Association of University Women, Ida's Legacy, the Vivian G. Harsh Society, the Hairpin Arts Center, the League of Women Voters, and the Working Women's History Project. All of these organizations' website links are in the chat. To view tonight's program, as well as the first two events of our series, you can visit the Hairpin Arts Center uh, YouTube channel, and uh, you'll be able to see those there. And the Next Step Collaborative expects to continue similar discussions in the future, so stay tuned for notifications, and you'll be the first to see uh, where we go uh, in the future. 
Thank you and have a great evening. Thank you.